York City. It's the Gary Mills Show. Hi everyone, I'm Gary Knoll. Today, a special, original, in-depth white paper. We're going to talk about the U.S. healthcare system is predatory. It's time for universal medical coverage. Richard Gale, one of our scholars and residents, myself, have spent a lot of hours on this. Everything is fully documented. The article is being posted as we speak on prn.fm. If you believe or trust the information I am sharing, that it's an answer to many of our problems, then please share it everywhere. Every legislator at the state level, the federal level, people within the news media. We need to bring forth those individuals like Professor Michael Hudson, uh, Joseph Stiglitz, people who have a knowledge of what really is important when it comes to our our economics, what we can afford and not. And then following this will be an in-depth discussion with a guest from Oxford University, Professor Peter Wadhams. He is probably the world's leading authority. He's Professor Emeritus on the Arctic and its melting we want to keep you in the loop on the latest from the finest minds. We begin. For a nation that prides itself on being the world's wealthiest and most innovative, as well as technologically the most advanced, the United States healthcare system is nothing less than a disaster and a disgrace. Not only are Americans the least healthy among the most developed nations, but the United States health system also ranks dead last among high-income countries. Despite rising costs and our unshakable faith in American medical assimilation, average life expectancy in the United States has remained lower than other developed countries for many years and has continued to decline for the past three years. On the other hand, countries with universal health care coverage find their average life expectancy stable or actually increasing. The fundamental problem in Washington is that both parties are beholden to the pharmaceutical and private insurance industries. Neither has the courage or the will to spurn their corporate donors to do what is sensible, financially feasible, and morally correct to improve America's quality of health and well-being. Our system is horribly broken. If this weren't so, the single-payer debate would not be as contentious as it is at this moment. Poll after poll shows that the American public favors the expansion of public health coverage. Other incremental proposals, including Medicare and Medicaid buy-in plans, are also widely preferred to the Obamacare mess we are currently stuck with. It is not difficult to imagine how the dismal state of American medicine could be the result of a system that is completely sold out to free market ideology and the bottom line interest of drug makers, health care mega corporations, and the always vile insurance industry in Wall Street. How advanced and ethically sound can a health care system be if tens of millions of people have no access to medical care because it is financially out of their reach. The United Nations recognizes health care as a human right. Last year, former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon denounced the American health care system as politically and morally wrong. Ki-moon belongs to a group known as the Elders, founded by Nelson Mandela and funded by Sir Richard Branson and musician Peter Gabriel. A group of older wise Statesmen and women around the world determined to tackle global crisis during their remaining years and unafraid to take on the capitalist system. Among their initiatives is global universal health care, and the U.S. has been an enormous roadblock in reaching that goal. The United States health care system is a public economic failure, benefiting no one 
except the large and increasingly consolidated insurance firms at the top and that ultimately supervise the racket. The entire system is another example of the moral deterioration that fuels the inequality plaguing the nations for at least the last 45 years. Our political parties have wrestled with single-payer or universal health care for decades. Former President Obama ran his first 2008 presidential campaign on a single-payer platform. His campaign health advisor, the late Dr. Quentin Young from the University of Illinois Medical School, was one of the nation's leading voices calling for universal health care since 1986. Among the 35 most developed nations, 32 have some form of universal health care systems. However, past efforts to even raise the issue have been rapidly attacked and falsely discredited. The fact that the matter is that a huge army of private interest are determined to keep the public enslaved to private insurers and high medical cost. The failure of our health care is no small measure due to it being a fully for-profit operation. Industry and older corporate rank-and-file Democrats, as well as almost all Republicans, argue that a single-payer or socialized medical program is unaffordable. However, not only is single-payer affordable, it will be in the long term saving us $2 trillion annually. Later in this report, I'll document exactly how that is done. <clears throat> it will end bankruptcies due to unpayable medical debt. In addition, as we outline in a moment, universal health care structured on a preventable model will reduce disease rates at the very outset. During a private conversation with Dr. Young shortly before he passed in 2016, he conveyed his sense of betrayal at the hands of the Obama administration. Already in his 80s, when he joined the Obama team to help lead the young senator to victory with a promise that America would finally catch up with other nations, he sounded like a defeated man. Dr. Young showed that he was manipulated and that Obama personally held no sincere intention to make universal health care part of his administration's agenda. In fact, during the closed-door negotiations that spawned the weak compromise bill known as Obamacare, that were always in attendance the insurance industry and major pharmaceutical interest, but the people who knew best how to create this bill were excluded. There were dozens upon dozens of meetings at the White House, and probably hundreds, even thousands collectively, around other governmental agencies involved in health care decisions and in corporate headquarters, but not one single progressive mind from the medical community or the health community was ever invited. I know that because I sent my resume and my deep background, academic credentials, and experience as a clinician, not a single response. But others that also did the same also had no response. But if you were a person that supported massive increases in profit for the insurance industry, oh, you were immediately invited. Dr. Young was neither consulted nor invited to participate. In fact, he stated that he never heard from Obama again after the election after he was used and his position and power within the community helped Obama, Obama left him behind. The record shows that the principal parties meeting with the Obama administration were from the insurance and medical industries. It is they who created Obamacare, and shame on the Democrats for continuing to support and beat the drums for Obamacare and criticize or attack anyone, including their own party members or other liberals or progressives, who knew that it was a sham from the get-go. But that's what it was. It is they who created Obamacare. It was left to the charismatic and charming Obama to offer this up to the public as a spectacular victory. Today, the pharmaceutical, HMO, and insurance industries, as well as the medicine's most prominent professional associations in medical schools and the Wall Street firms, comprise a powerful cartel, and their tentacles 
are wrapped around the throats of politicians and federal health agencies. They alone determine, no one else, no one else, how the entire health community will fashion health care in its own rapacious image. Obama's domestic promises and accomplishments, including Obamacare, were anemic at best and vile at worst. The policies he enacted only further muddied the waters with esoteric taxes, short-sighted giveaways, and bureaucratic hurdles. Meanwhile, the physical and mental health of the nation continued to erode. Corporate Democrats like the Clintons and virtually Nancy Pelosi and all the others that argued for Obamacare and, and the 2010 Affordable Care Act, they said was a positive step inching the country towards complete public coverage. Nonsense. However, aside from providing coverage to the poorest of Americans, Affordable Care Act turned into another financial anchor around the necks of millions of more Americans. Since the law was enacted, the average price for a family health policy has risen $2,200. Patient out-of-pocket hospitalization costs are also increasing and have now reached $329 billion. The Affordable Care Act is riddled with loopholes benefiting the private insurers who actually wrote the bill. After Obama left office, 28 million people remained uninsured. Rather than health care spending lessening, as Obama promised, it has exploded. Since Trump took his place upon the throne, an additional 7 million Americans fell into medical hardship and joined the uninsured. Over 5% of American children under 18 remain uninsured. These figures are in no way indicative of a, quote, strong economy, as Trump has claimed. Clearly, a universal health program would require flipping the script on the entire private insurance industry, which employs approximately 500,000 people. And yet the private health insurers' profits continue to surge. For the first three months of 2017, the top five for-profit insurers collected $4.5 billion in net-net earnings. Yet this seems conservatively low. Last year, Modern Healthcare reported that Health United alone cracked the $200 billion in revenue. That's just for one year, showing a 30% increase in profit. And none of this extreme wealth went directly towards preventing any disease. It was all a middleman scam. But how's that happen? <clears throat> How can you earn $200 billion and show a $4.5 billion profit? It's simple. You, you cause every single expense that you have to be written as an expense. The bonuses that all your executives get, that's an expense. Your private jet fleet, that's an expense. The lobbyists that you pay to make sure that you stay in power, that's an expense. So if you're a major corporation, you can eat through all that money, decorating your offices, anything you want to do, it's a write-down. Democrats are becoming more sharply divided over the matter, and that's a good thing. Why? It will be a critical issue for Democrats looking to enter the White House in 2020, and corporate Democrats beholden to the pharmaceutical and insurance industries will face harsh opposition for re-election. Lancy Pelosi fills much of her campaign war chest with contributions from the health care industry, which amounted to $1.18 million last election cycle. According to Kaiser Healthcare News, the top three Democrats in the House, Nancy Pelosi, Steny Hoyer, and James Clyburn, collected $2.3 million in campaign contributions from the pharmaceutical industry. Hoyer is particularly... Uh, in an important position because he received more PAC financing from drug makers than any other member of Congress. Yet most people are not aware of that. <clears throat> Obviously, the most volatile debate concerning a national health care system is cost. Although there is already a socialized medical system in place, and people say we're against socialized medicine, especially the right. Okay. Before you say you're against something, understand that every single federal legislator 
every bureaucrat, every government employee, every veteran benefits from it. Fiscal conservatives and groups like the Koch Brothers Network, including the Koch-funded Mercatus Center at George Mason University, are single-mindedly dedicated to preventing the expansion of Medicare and Medicaid. Isn't it interesting that people worth, two brothers worth over $140 billion between the two of them, should challenge people who have no income, people who are dead poor, that maybe they shouldn't have it either. <clears throat> that is arrogance. Government medical coverage already reached between 36 to 48 percent of Americans, according to U.S. Census Bureau. The Mercatus analysis made the outrageous claim that a single-payer system would increase federal health spending by $32 trillion in 10 years. However, analysis and reviews by the Congressional Budget Office in the early 1990s concluded that such a system would only increase spending at the start. It would quickly be offset by enormous savings as the years pass. In one analysis, quote, the savings in administrative cost would be more than enough to offset the expense of universal coverage, end quote. High administrative cost overshadowed all aspects of U.S. health care, not just the insurance industry. 25% of hospital spending is purely administrative, compared to 16% in the United Kingdom. And in fact, one CNBC report that $275 billion was wasted in insurance paperwork. They're understating it. In addition, they're billing services which in one year, was $471 billion to physicians, hospitals, supply services, and private and public insurers. Therefore, <clears throat> the private insurance industry and private billing services would have to either re be removed from the equation altogether or radically reformed in order to comply with federal rules rather than dictating them. The Green Party's Dr. Margaret Flowers, the national coordinator of Health Over Profit for Everyone, argues that a single-payer system is, quote, the best way to put private insurers on the margins of our health care system and to control the pharmaceutical industry, end quote, as well as their exorbitant drug prices. Indeed, a universal health care system would increase federal spending, but at the same time, independent analysis indicate it would reduce the nation's total health care cost. That's a critical goal we should be striving for. Compared to other nations, the U.S. spends a disproportionate amount on health care. According to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, last year the U.S. spent approximately $10,740 per person. However, as we will show you, this is a misleading figure. It conceals the deeper problems running through the system. Compare this with Switzerland, the second highest per capita spender at 8000 or 28% less. At present, health care accounts for 18% of the U.S.'s gross domestic product, an unsustainable figure as cost increase. After the U.S. and Switzerland, per capita expenditures decreased dramatically, with Germany at third with 5,700. France, Canada, Belgium, Japan, and Australia and the U.K. each spend far less, more than half less than the United States, <clears throat> and yet they have better outcomes medically. An investigative review published by The Atlantic found that more than half of health care spending goes to only 5% of patients. If this money were equally distributed, then the 10740 per capita expenditure for every adult and child would make sense. The writer calls this tiny segment of the patients who dominate health care costs the platinum patients. Most of these medical frequent flyers are the elderly and the chronically ill who have reached the final months or days of their lives. This is where tens of billions of dollars in care and treatment are spent annually. This is the sweet spot for the medical industrial complex. These are the people they exploit and profit most from. This segment of patients is also the most lucrative for private insurers, hospitals, and doctors. Patients who charts can be loaded <clears throat> with unnecessary diagnosis tests, pres drug prescriptions, and medical procedures to further scam the system. The ultimate outcome for the patient is death. The ultimate outcome for the system is profit. Now, just an idea. It is true that we spend an enormous amount on in-stage care. 
wouldn't it make more sense in every major community to build a quality of life care center where we could use complementary and holistic modalities, those from ancient traditions like Ayurvedic and, and Oriental medicine, the best of complementary and alternative medicine, that have been shown to improve people even at the end stages, reducing pain, not giving them narcotics and opiates so they're not in some completely altered state, but rather quality care where they have music therapy and animal therapies and the kind of holistic integrative work that is done throughout the world and has for a long time. Wouldn't you rather see someone that you love in a center that cares for him, giving him organic foods and, and uh, the proper supplementation. I'm willing to bet that done properly, <clears throat> about 30% of those people would go from end stage back into life. That's how powerful lifestyle modification can be if you know what you're doing. The trouble is the entire medical industrial complex is completely oblivious to anything that can prevent disease, let alone that uses alternative methods to improve it. And also, funding a national health program would primarily be accomplished by raising taxes to levels comparable to other developed nations. The Green New Deal proposes uh, by, by Senator Sanders and others, and also the young uh, Democrat in the House, that uh, Cortez, that we would tax the highest multi-million and multi-billion dollar earners 60 to 70 percent. Now, of course, there's immediate outrage from the critics, including the old rank and file Democrats like Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer. This is still far less than in the past. Let me remind you that during the Korean War, the top tax rate was 91 percent. It declined to 70 percent in the late 1960s and throughout most of the 1970s. Those in the lowest income bracket were taxed at 14 percent. And life, including health care, was affordable then. But also, here is the rub. And here's something we've refused to have an honest discussion on in our society. If you want adequate money to pay for infrastructure, to get a wise America, to help the public educational system, to provide assistance for public education at the college level, then you're going to have to have a flat tax <clears throat> with no ability for any corporation to pay a lot of money to get tax experts to keep them from paying any taxes. So at the one hand, if you did have a 60% tax, even a 70% tax, unlike Denmark that has a very high tax, but the people accept it because they don't have a military industrial complex where that money is being wasted with regime, regime changes around the world. The money actually goes for people's education and maternity leave and longer vacations, shorter work weeks, and universal health care. So yes, they have a higher tax, but it's a tax that they've accepted because they see the benefits. In the United States, our government does nothing but waste money all the time, every second of every day. In fact, right now, as I'm speaking, $21 trillion is unaccounted for in the Department of Defense. Now, you would think that if they mismanaged or stole or misappropriated or misused that kind of money, someone would be of, of concern. Not at all. So we have all the money in the world without any of the Democrats or Republicans complaining when it comes to fueling the disastrous, inhumane, unethical, and illegal wars in government interventions around the world, including now in Venezuela. But we, we complain about spending money helping feed a homeless child and a hungry a youngster. That shows a lot about what those people in power have been. So if you had one tax that every corporation had to pay 20% and no deductions, no offshoring, then you would have money for these things. <clears throat> but the Democratic supporters of the Affordable Care Act who oppose the universal health care plan, and that's Hillary Clinton and Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, ignore the additional 20 new taxes that were levied to pay for the program. Yeah. You were also taxed with Obamacare surtaxes on investment income, Medicare taxes from those earning over 200000 taxes on tanning services, an excise tax on medical equipment, and a 40% tax on health coverage 
for cost over the designated cap that applied to flexible savings and health savings accounts. The entire Obama and Affordable Care Act was messy and unnecessarily complicated from the start. And the people who suffered the most from these hidden details, yet were mandated by law to purchase private insurance, were those that just missed the poverty line cutoff. Other public health costs are completely out of kilter, presenting a completely avoidable drain on the system. The fact that Obamacare created and strengthened two parallel systems, federal and private, with entirely different economic structures, created a labyrinth of red tape rules and wasteful bureaucracy. And since the Affordable Care Act went into effect, over 150 new boards, new agencies, new programs have had to be established to monitor the 2,700 page pages of gibberish, a federal single-payer system would easily eliminate all of that bureaucracy and waste. You could do everything I'm telling you is impossible within 100 pages. But wasn't Nancy Pelosi who said, we can't tell you what's in the law because you have to pass it and then we'll read it. Now think of that for a moment. Just stop for a moment. The people in Congress who are elected to create the laws and then to challenge them, go through committees and pass them, didn't contribute anything to this law. Outside investors did, outside for-profit incentive people, lobbyists did. <clears throat> right then and there, you should have uh, raised hell and brought this to a stop, but it didn't happen. A medical new deal to establish universal health care coverage is a decisive step in the correct direction. The energy behind the younger generation of Democratic legislators is admirable, but we question whether they possess the wisdom to address the fullness of our health system and crisis. We must look at the crisis holistically in a measured and proper manner, in a systematic way. It's one thing to say anything that you decide is important, and it may be. It's something else to have your facts correct and do your scholarship, which is completely absent in Washington, D.C. These are some of the least informed individuals in the world, but they have the charisma. When the camera's on, they talk. Simply shuffling private insurance into a federal Medicare for all or buy-in program funded by taxing the wealthiest of citizens may not only reduce costs, possibly only temporarily, it will not curtail nor slash escalating rates of disease. Any effective health care reform must also tax or ta tackle the underlying reasons why Americans are in such a poor state of health. We must not shy away from the examining the social illnesses infecting our entire free market capitalist culture and its addiction to deregulation. A viable health care model must structurally transform how the medical economy operates. And finally, a successful Medical New Deal must honestly evaluate the best and most reliable scientific evidence in order to effectively redirect public health spending. For example, years ago, Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel, a former Obama health care advisor and brother of Ron Emanuel, noted that AIDS HIV measures consume the most public health spending, even though the disease ranks 75th on the list of diseases by personal health expenditures. On the other hand, according to the American Medical Association, a large percentage of the nation's $3.4 trillion annual health care spending goes towards treating preventable diseases, notably diabetes, common forms of heart disease, and back and neck pain. In 2016, these three conditions, just them, were the most costly and accounted for approximately $277 billion in spending. So ask yourself this. When was last time the Surgeon General and the U.S. Public Health Service, the National Cancer Institute, the National Institute for Allergies and Infectious Disease, the FDA, the CDC, held preventative programs of how do we get diseased and how can we prevent it. It's never happened, and it won't happen. It can happen. It's not physically and humanly possible because to tell the truth about what makes us sick, you're going to be challenging about 90% of all the major corporations in America that lobby in Washington. No one is going to want to know that meat or artificial sweeteners or alcohol or pizzas, hot dogs, hamburgers, lack of exercise, the chemicals in our clothing, the chemicals in our carpets, particle boards, no one who
who manufactures that is going to sit by. <clears throat> they would have a legion of lobbyists descend upon their legislators, fill their pockets with cash, and then start their attack campaigns with trolls and the doctors and scientists that are so easily purchased nowadays to go forth on their public television stations like CNN and uh, MSNBC and Fox and tell you the so-called truth about vaccines or the truth about fluoridated water, the truth about sugar and the truth about fat and the truth about all of it lies. But the average American wouldn't know they were being lied to. So we just don't have any preventative program at all in the United States. And please don't mention, I'll get your mammogram because I'll show you where it actually causes more cancers than it's able to detect and prevent cancer in those future uh, cases. So that's where we're at. The rate of autism has increased 15% in only the last two years. It now stands at 1 in 28 boys and 1 in 152 girls. The CDC estimates that 1 in 40 children between 3 and 17 are autistic. So you're talking about at least 7 million parents believed in the public health advocacy of vaccine safety and efficacy. Now they end up with 3.5 million autistic children. <clears throat> Do we believe them? Not at all. Trust her. Well, yes, if one thing happens, but no, if she's talking about vaccines or no, if she's talking about organic food or instead of GMOs or no, if she's talking about sugar. And so there's a whole long laundry list of what we will not trust you or believe you if you decide to challenge industries. Those industries also fund think tanks. Think tanks also have control over a lot of social movements. And that's where it's at. The 2015 economic burden of autism was $268 billion, And in the next six years, we'll be spending almost a half a trillion dollars a year just on autism. That's a half trillion for one type of illness. What's being done to prevent it? Nothing. What's being done, to be honest, about the environmental factors that can cause it, like aluminum and mercury, chemicals? Nothing. What's being done to show people all the ingredients and how toxic they are and cite the scientific literature on how toxic an ingredient is? Nothing. Except the parents who now had healthy children who are autistic are being attacked by the pro AstroTurf groups on behalf of the vaccine makers. There are no signs that this alarming trend is slowing or stopping, and yet our entire federal health system has failed to search honestly and conscientiously for the underlying cause of this epidemic. All explanations that might interfere with the pharmaceutical industry's unchecked growth, such as over-vaccination, are ignored and viciously discredited without any sound scientific evidence. The evidence is on the side of the parents who become educated after the fact. Therefore, a proper medical new deal would require an overhaul and reform of our entire federal health agencies. I would fire every single human being in every single health agency. They're an embarrassment. <clears throat> they've sold out. And those who haven't sold out have kept quiet by others. They've seen the corruption. They've seen the scams. They've seen the influence, and they've stayed silent. Then, ladies and gentlemen, if you work in those agencies, you are co-conspirators. You may be in the back seat of a getaway car, and they've robbed a bank and shot some people, and now you're caught. Are you going to say, well, I didn't rob the bank, so I'm not complicit? Yes, you are. We need to point this out because these are now not organizations representing the health. And yet, look, every time there's a movie made, they have their input on the script and everything else, just like the military industrial complex does in all, all war films. This new health care plan, the plan must prioritize spending in a manner that serves public health and stop all of the excessive profit-taking. You've got to take the profit out of medicine in order for medicine to be effectively serving the people. It will also require placing all private corporate interests and their lobbyists on the sidelines, banning them by law from not interfering in any of these uh, practices. So this would be the correct approach. However, there's zero opportunity for this to ever happen. Our legislators are too corrupt. We have some new idealists. Good. 
<clears throat> they should keep agitating. If nothing else for a moment, they make the old guard that have made a career out of being uh, the spokesperson for special interest a little embarrassed. But for all of those who are progressive and want the right kind of health care, I'm merely showing you what we have to do. And most important, America's health care system, as well as the new Green Deal or the new uh, Green New Deal, almost completely ignores the single most critical initiative to reduce cost, that is, preventative efforts and programs instead of deregulation and loopholes designed to protect the drug and insurance industry's bottom line. Prevention can begin with banning toxic chemicals that are proven health hazards associated with current disease epidemics. This should be a no-brainer for any legislator who cares about public health. Unfortunately, unlike Europe, the United States continues per to permit numerous toxic chemicals, including many known carcinogens, proven carcinogens, to get into our common everyday products. Stacey Mal Malkin, co-founder of the Campaign for Safe Chemicals, notes, quote, the policy approach in the U.S. and Europe is dramatically different when it comes to chemical allowances and cosmetic products, whereas the European Union has banned 1,238 toxic substances from the cosmetic industry alone, the U.S. has only banned 11. 1,328 banned in Europe, the same chemicals allowed in the United States. We ban 11. The U.S. continues to allow carcinogenic formaldehyde, petroleum, many parabens, and estrogen mimickers, and endocrine hormone destroyers, the highly allergenic PBDs, and triclosan, which is in your antibacterial soaps, which you should never use, which has been associated with the rise in antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Other toxic chemicals are commonly used in the American food system, potassium bromate and ADA, are frequently found in baked foods, yet both are banned in Europe due to its cancer risk allowed in the United States. They're in your breads, your buns, your pastry dough, your pizzas. Yeah, and yet the fast food industry continues to use it extensively. The International Agency for Research on Cancer has labeled the chemical a likely human carcinogen, yet it's allowed by the FDA. And there are thousands over 100,000 artificial chemicals that are not being researched for their toxicity that are ending up in our bodies. <clears throat> Next, the food Americans consume must be evaluated for its health benefits. We see no problem in taxing the unhealthiest foods, such as the commercial junk foods, the sodas and candies, and products that contain ingredients proven to be toxic, and meat products laden with dangerous chemicals, including growth hormones and antibiotics. The scientific evidence that the average American diet is contributing to disease is indisputable. There are thousands of studies proving this. And measures to improve the quality of America's health demand upon harsh reality checks. After acknowledging the $3.4 trillion is being spent on American health care every year, we must look at how it's being spent. It is highly unlikely, if not impossible, that our suggestions be taken seriously. But for you as individuals, understand the system. Physicians are also forced into a bind, and this is contributing to prodigious waste of money and resources. In one year, $55.6 billion of annual health care spending went towards medical liability insurance. Isn't it time that we, we asked all physicians not to get liability insurance? Instead, we should pass a universal, universal health insurance. No fault. <clears throat> it covers all doctors, hospitals, and nurses. Legions of liability and trial lawyers seeking big paydays, not for their patients, for themselves, stemming from physician error, would then have to actually go get a regular job. Forbes reports that the cost of medical malpractice runs $55 billion per year. This has created a culture of fear among doctors and hospitals, resulting in the overly cautious practice of defensive medicine driving up costs and insurance premiums just to avoid lawsuits. Doctors are forced to order unnecessary tests and prescribe more medications and medical procedures just to cover their backsides. Last year, $200 billion was spent on unnecessary medical tests compared to $6 billion just six years ago. The blowback has been tragic, and the medical errors continue. In fact, I'm going to give you the best that I can on this. I'm going to skip ahead to a chart, and this will tell you everything. 
The rest of the article you can read on PRN.FM downloaded. The chart that I'm going to read from now summarizes estimated costs that may be saved by converting to a national universal health care program. If a truly concerted effort were made to overhaul our system, savings would reach over $2.6 trillion a year. That figure does not even include the billions in savings that could be achieved if drug prices were brought down and regulated at the lower level. Here are the examples. Medical insurance waste, $275 billion. Insurance billing, $471 billion. Medical school education, per average year, $3.8 billion. Medical fraud, $140 billion. Unnecessary medical testing, $210 billion. Unnecessary administrative service, $190 billion. Inefficient delivery service, $130 billion. Misused preventative opportunities, $55 billion. Unnecessary price hikes, $105 billion. Total economic impact due to medical error, $1 trillion. Total cost and savings, $2.6 trillion. And what does that not include? That does not include if we prevented diseases, which we could, with a proper education program from early life right through college and on, and had health clinics people could go to, free health clinics, to get educated on how to select food, how to buy food, how to prepare food, how to do juices, and how to prevent disease. You're dealing with at least a trillion dollars there. So let's hear again how we can afford it. Well, we can not only afford it, but we could actually bring money back to the Treasury. This would be self-financed. So you see, there we've laid it out. And regardless of its critics, a single-payer program is completely feasible and well within the nation's reach. Dean Baker at the Center for Economic and Policy Research states, quote, the government already pays for more than half of the nation's health care bill through Medicare and Medicaid and veterans benefits and other public sector programs. Getting Medicare for all would mean covering the other half of the current expenses, along with the additional cost of paying for the uninsured and underinsured who are not getting their care. And finally, we must acknowledge that our health care system is fundamentally a despotic rationing system based upon high insurance costs vis-a-vis a toss of the dice to determine where a person sits on the economic ladder. So do we have the courage to tell the people in the profit-making insurance business, you're out, you're gone, we don't need you, you're just an administrator in the middle land, and you're taking a trillion dollars a year of this 3.4 trillion, you're gone. Insurance is gone. Now all those high prices charging 5,000% above the cost. No, we're going towards the cost and giving 100% profit. Any other nation in in any business would be happy to have 100% profit, guaranteed. Doctors, we're going to pay for your education. You're not going to get out of medical school with any debt. Nurses, the same. But in return, you'll be given a living wage, two, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000, so you don't have to do any defensive medicine. You don't have to be overcharging. You don't have to look at a patient as your next mortgage to do something you didn't, didn't have to do. And therefore, you can practice safer medicine. Death by medicine, nitrogen is the number one cause of death in the United States. I'm not even referring to that in this discussion. That's the latest on health and healing. This is a part of the article, U.S. Predatory Health Care and What We Can Do to Change It. I'm Gary Nall. Back in a moment with my guests. Please stay with us. We're going now to Cambridge University in the United Kingdom. We're going to discuss the rapidly changing conditions in the Arctic and their larger impact on global climate and weather conditions. My guest is Professor Peter Wadhams, W-A-D-H-A-M-S. He is Professor Emeritus of Ocean Physics and the head of the Polar Oceans Physics Group at the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics at Cambridge University. He is the former director of the Scott Polar Research Institute He is also recognized and renowned as a scientist in the field of Arctic regions and the impacts of climate change and the rapid loss of polar ice. He has participated in 50 polar expeditions. His book, A Farewell to Ice, is a frontline report from a world leader in Arctic polar sciences that outlines his dire warnings. And he is here today. Nice to have you with us, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, Nice to be here. 
The past five years have been reported as the Arctic's warmest years on record since 1900, and surface temperatures are warming twice the rate to the rest of the planet. I feel it's important that we return over and over again to informing people what is happening in the Arctic, although it seems so far removed from us because future life on Earth depends so heavily upon the changes happening there. And it's difficult for many people to understand this. So what is the greatest threat we face as the Arctic continues to warm? And explain in that what the 50 gigaton pulse is and what are the larger ramifications we face from this pulse. Take your time. The form is yours. Okay, thank you. Well, um, there's a number of threats, all of which are, are pretty dire, and they they stem really from the the fact that the Arctic is warming uh, about three or four times as fast as the rest of the planet. So one of these is the fact that the the very rapid warming is causing the uh, sea ice to retreat, and the re the retreat of sea ice is giving you. Uh, an acceleration to global climate warming because you're replacing the white surface of, of sea ice and the white surface of the snow on the surrounding land by a dark surface, which is the, the, the sea, the, uh, the, the open sea or, or the tundra. And that's giving uh, greater absorption of solar radiation and an acceleration of, of warming. So this, uh, Accelerated warming in the Arctic is going to continue by the fact that, that the Arctic warming is giving a reduction in sea ice area. So we face a threat from, from this faster warming rate in the Arctic. Uh, but that has other effects, and you mentioned one, which is the, the possibility of a methane outbreak. Uh, now, we, we know that methane is making a contribution to global warming by the fact that uh, it's, it's a very powerful greenhouse gas and we're getting more of it released into the atmosphere by the uh, retreat of um, permafrost on land and that's the uh, as, as, as the uh, surface of the Arctic warms up, Arctic terrestrial areas warm up um, you get the permafrost which is frozen soil melting and that frozen soil which contains a lot of um, uh, vegetable material then starts to to sort of rot away and generate methane so we're getting methane from huge area of land in in the the northern terrain of of Euro europe and asia and uh, and north america um, but a possibly greater threat comes from offshore because um, in the continental shelves, the, the shallow water off the coast of, of the Arctic, we're finding that um, under, under that, those, that shallow water, there's very thick layers of sediment which contain uh, large amounts of methane. It, that methane is sort of held down by a kind of pressure cooker effect, which is the, uh, the fact that there is a covering of permafrost of subterranean, sub, submarine permafrost dating back from the last ice age. Now, um, that permafrost is now melting because as the sea ice retreats, it means that the, the water temperature goes up. And so we're no longer having the, uh, the offshore regions bathed in, in, froze, in freezing water, but they're bathed in warmer water. And that warmer water melts the uh, as that melts the permafrost, the, the, the underlying methane can escape. And that, that comes out as, as huge plumes of bubble plumes, which wherever you go to the Arctic in the summer, you see these, and they're increasing in, in magnitude. But uh, if there were a very large increase in magnitude, uh, for instance, if, if all that uh, pressure cooker lid came away, then uh, you would have a huge methane outbreak, which would then give a, a kind of instantaneous jump in polar warming or in global warming, uh, which could be more than half a degree. And that would be, that would be pretty catastrophic, I think, for, for global climate and, and for our experience of the world. So those are the, the things that, that are worrying about this rapid change in the Arctic. It, it's not uh, just 
uh, what, 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 what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. It's, it's a, it has global effects. And, and another one that we could mention is, is uh, sea level rise, because as the uh, ice retreats from the Arctic Ocean and gives you open water surrounding continents like Greenland, we find that Greenland itself warms up. Greenland is, of course, a, a continent entirely made of ice, and that will increase the melt of ice from Greenland. That increases the, the, the amount of fresh water going into the ocean and increases sea level rise. So we can expect sea level rise to, to become more um, prevalent and, and more rapid as time goes on. And uh, that, that gives us uh, something to really worry about, which is that uh, with, with Greenland melting, uh, we're being, beginning to find Antarctica also melting, and between them, they could uh, greatly increase the rate of sea level rise, which is a threat to, to our coastlines around the world, cities um, like Miami and, and uh, New Orleans, and, and also uh, coast, coastal areas where uh, a lot of poor people live, like Bangladesh, where people can't afford to build flood defences. So sea level rise is, a, is a, a really increasing threat, and it's a product of sea ice retreat because the sea ice is no longer protecting uh, the islands of Greenland and Antarctica from, uh, from summer melt. I'd like to add something that I just read this morning from the British Antarctic Society. It's a study showing melting ice sheets will disrupt climate, watering of the water entering the oceans from melting ice sheets could cause extreme weather and a change in the ocean circulation not currently accounted for in the global climate policies. And this is very serious. Could you address that, please? Um, yes. Well, that's the uh, – since, since about 2004, 2005, we've had really seriously disruptive climate so oh, seriously disrupted weather. You have you can't call it climate yet because it's only happened for a few years. But seriously disruptive weather in the winter, um, and it's, that's been experienced, of course, in North America very much, and now it's happening in Europe. Um, and that is that you get extreme outbreaks of either very cold weather or very warm weather in the middle of the winter. And that, when you trace that back it seems to, to be caused by a breakup of the continuity of the jet stream. And the jet stream is the, the wind system that separates polar air from, from tropical air, and it's the thing that blows you eastwards if you're flying from the U.S. to Europe. Um, but the, 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 the driver of this wind is the temperature difference between the Arctic and the, Ant and the tropics, and the trouble is that the Arctic is warming very rapidly, more rapidly than the tropics. So the temperature difference between the Arctic and the tropics is going down, and that means the driving force for this wind is going down, and the jet stream is diminishing in strength. It's becoming a much weaker wind. And as it becomes weaker, it, it breaks up. The, the, instead of being a very strong line of wind in, in, that you can trace across the world. It's breaking up into lobes and, and little bits and pieces, and the, the whole structure of the jet stream breaks up completely. So instead of separating polar air from tropical air, it, it, it fails to do that job, and you find outbreaks of tropical air moving up into the north, and you find, therefore, something like winter on the prairies becomes very tropical, and, and then you find... Um, polar air coming down for much further south than it ought to and so you get these extreme weather events which keep breaking records and everybody says this has never happened before it's a one-off thing but it's not a one-off thing it's, it's a, a product of this breakup of the jet stream and the, the trouble with it is uh, apart from all the disruption that these weather events cause to, to people's day-to-day -day lives, they also cause a huge disruption to crop production because all these uh, polar air coming too far south, tropical air going too far north, they both interact in about the middle latitudes. That's where 
the biggest disruptions are happening. That's firstly where most, most Europeans live and North Americans, but it's also where most of the crops of the world are grown in that band around uh, from the, the Midwest to, to, to through Europe to Ukraine and, and Asia. That's, our, that's the, the breadbasket of the world. And if crop production is upset, which it is being by, by these uh, weather events, then we're going to face a, a food production crisis at a time when the human population is still increasing without seemingly without any restraint. And uh, we, we're going to come into a big, a big collision between food production going down and human population going up. I appreciate those insights. We're out of time, but a Japanese monitoring satellite observed bubbling forth from the Arctic permafrost. And as you mentioned, that's a very serious situation. If methane begins to release, it could just pass the tipping point. Mm. Or has that tipping point been reached yet? Well, that, that's the threat. I mean, the, uh, from land, uh, these methods are detecting uh, methane being released from melting permafrost. The big, the big thing that seems to be these big explos- and subterranean explosions of methane, which are producing these great big craters in the Arctic. So that's happening, but it's, it's a slow, fairly slow process. Uh, what will be the real threat would be the underwater methane, uh, methane being released from the uh, offshore Arctic. If that, uh, if that actually broke out into a, a very big rapid release due to the, the, uh, the, the overlying permafrost disappearing, then that would be a very, very major threat to the planet. Um, the, 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 the loss of permafrost from land is is serious in the long run, but um, is 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 fairly slow. But release from from the offshore would be very sudden, and that that would be very nasty indeed. Also, keep in mind with the Arctic drilling going full steam ahead, all that has to happen is one of those methane craters come up underneath one of those oil derricks, and you will have something that will dwarf anything like the Verizon. Uh, oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. It could happen. I want to thank you very much for being on and for your outstanding uh, work, and hopefully people will start to pay attention. Uh, My guest, his book is A Farewell to Ice. Uh, We're talking to him from Cambridge University in the United Kingdom, Professor Emeritus Peter Wadhams. I look forward to filming you uh, in the next week or two over there. Thank you. Yes, thanks very much. Look forward to that. We're out of time, everyone. Thank you all for listening. Have a nice day.